What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Some you've heard of, and some people have, you know, they've heard of, they've never heard of them, Nate. And one that always, you know, there's there's, the founder of Atari on, he talks about how he was Steve Jobs' mentor and how he turned down, uh, Steve Jobs offered him 33% of Apple for $50,000 and why he said no. So you could check that episode out. And um, Ed O'Keefe strikes me, Ed O'Keefe, founder of Wake Up Foods. Um, he talks about challenging himself physically, not just mentally. Um, he completed Kokoro Camp, which is uh, based on a Navy SEAL Hell Week training uh, put on by Mark Devine and SEAL Fit. And uh, by the way, running his business, if ever I have excuses, Nate, I think of Ed because he's got seven kids and he runs his business and he finds time to work out. So if I find myself making excuses, Ed, you pop into my mind, no excuses, okay? This episode is brought to you by, before I introduce today's guest, um, you, you should listen to this episode because um, Nate, I'm going to introduce in a second, uh, runs and owns investmentbank.com and seo.co. And he's going to walk us through several deals um, and like just taking us through the journey a little bit, uh, which is cool to see. Uh, but the episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. And um, at Rise25, we help businesses connect to their dream 100 clients, referral partners, strategic partners, form amazing relationships through running their podcast. I get to chat today with Nate, who's awesome and has done some amazing things because of the podcast, case in point, and share his thought leadership and knowledge. Um, And so if you thought about, and Nate has a podcast too, by the way, if you thought about, you know, creating a podcast, give us a call. We've been doing it for over 10 years um, uh, you can email us or go to rise25.com and watch my business partner and I make a video and uh, we banter like an old married couple. So you can watch that there. Um, so today I'm excited. We have Nate Need. Um, big shout out to Ryan Need, who reached out to me and we just through chatting, um, this happened. And also shout out to Chris Snyder, who runs banks.com. So Chris always gives me good ideas. So like, I think investmentbank.com and, and banks.com have to do some kind of work together, Nate. Um, so Nate Needs, founder of, I mentioned, investmentbank.com and seo.co. Nate's an experienced M&A advisor and investment banker who successfully managed numerous deals in real estate, software, hardware, digital marketing, and many more. He's founded and operated and exited several digital media, SaaS, and software companies, growing them from startup to multi-million dollar market leaders. And in addition, you know, Nate, if you weren't busy enough, I'm going to find out probably you have 10 kids or something. Um, in addition to running investment for four kids. Okay. Yeah, that's four. still not seven. Four. Okay. Four is still We're working on it. <laughs> impressive. Now you can pop into my head also with, okay, he's got four kids. I only have two and he's running multiple companies. Um, he runs SEO.co that provides online marketing, SEO link building services. They serve anyone from Fortune 500 companies to small startups. So Nate, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. Appreciate um, it. So there's a couple stories that you'll walk us through um, for different reasons, deals-wise. And um, investmentbank.com. First of all, um, talk about what you do there and how did you get the uh, domain, investmentbank.com. It does not seem like an easy domain to get. Sure. Uh, well, I, So I've been doing uh, investment banking for about a decade. And uh, I, the, the old model of it's kind of who you know, it's either you, you get it from referrals from uh, your CPAs, your, your, your wealth managers, your attorneys, and that's how you sor- source your deals or you're networking with business owners, which is still a, the, the best way to get your best leads and opportunities. But I, I thought, you know, in this new world, there's got to be a way to source leads online for people looking to acquire another business, sell their business, or maybe raise some growth capital. And so I just started hunting around for a really good domain name that I knew uh, I could leverage because the, the struggle is, is, I mean, exact match domains, you know, love them or hate them, they still do have a little bit more weight. 
Um, and they're, they're more easily sellable down the road, you know, if someone wants to buy them. And so I went, mm. I went and found one that wasn't being used and I reached out. I think the owner, I'm trying to remember now, the owner uh, was still an investment banker, but they were working for um, one of the, one of kind of your, your mid market, larger mid market firms. And they had founded investmentbank.com maybe 15 years ago. Mm. And then, then they then they had shut it down because they were both working at separate places at the time. And I negotiated with them a little bit and then bought it. Um, but then the real work starts because it had no links yeah. and no authority. And so it sat it sat without any traffic. Uh, you know, we had to build all the content out over a, kind of a three year period. Yeah. Um, Was that a start. hard negotiation, Nate? Because I could see first of all, the person in the investment banking they're used to negotiating. Second. You know, when someone has it for that long, they're like, oh, my God, I've already had it for this long. I need better get something good out of it. Yeah, I don't know. Is your definition a hard negotiation that it was expensive? I mean, I would I it was it was more than I would have liked to pay. But anything more <laughs> than a couple hundred bucks is probably more than I would like to pay. But I wouldn't considering uh, what it is. I've, I've already made my money back on it. Yeah. So. Was it worth it? Yeah, it was worth it. And, you know, it continues to bring bring in kind of daily lead flow. Um, but as the saying goes, uh, if you get 21 leads a day for a site like that, 22 of them are pure garbage. So, you, you know, you, you have to you have to sift through a lot of yeah. kind of bunk, bunk opportunities. How do you there. value a domain name when it's not been built out? You know, I how do you know it, what you were willing to pay for it? Yeah, if it's not if it's not built out, the only reason I'd really want it for its value is if it had some some sort of uh, brandability, and if it's a truly exact match for, for instance, like SEO.co, if it's truly that type of an exact match domain, I I strictly usually base it off of uh, keyword search volume, average cost per click. I might use estabot.com. And compare, you know, other domains on there, um, and so I, I use a combination of things. And a lot of times, it's just gut too. It's like, well, and and your ability to pay. It's like, well, it's out of my budget. Sorry, you know, I'm not. I don't. I'm. I'm. I, I don't have enough money to pay for it. So it's kind of a a, a weighted thing yeah. across um, across different ones. I mean, like for instance, we're we're launching Dev.co mm -hmm. for our software development teams, and mm -hmm. we we bought that like literally about a week ago, we're just building it out right now. So, and that, that one cool. we had to negotiate as well. So it's a three letter domain and .co, it's probably not easy to get. Yeah. Yeah. We had to, you know, and all the, all the good ones that I've ever had, it's either I bought them in auction auction um, and had to compete that way or, and, and those are the, I mean, I've gotten some cheap ones doing that. Um, like acquisition.net. I think I got it for like 600 bucks or something. Hmm. I use, I use Namejet uh, on auctions on occasion, but but most of most of the really good ones that are live domains that I'm using, I, it's negotiated. You so. have to reach out through the who is and and figure yeah, out all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we'll talk about the acquisition of SEO.co, which was um, Audience Bloom. But let's talk about Alaska. You're this company who you helped in Alaska. Walk us through a little bit about what they came to you with. What was the scenario? Yeah, so it's an oil, oil and gas distribution business. And if anyone knows Alaska, it's really kind of a, a provincial uh, market. There's you know 50 or so, 60 years ago when it became a state, you had a lot of families who were really entrenched up there and it really changed the dynamic of the environment. So each town, whether it's Ketchikan, Juneau, and even even Anchorage, but some of those smaller towns, they're really owned by like five or six families. Each town will have five or six families that own the whole town. When I say own, they have all the, they have most of the real estate. They own a bunch of the businesses. And and this particular family up there in Ketchikan had this oil distribution business. A lot of the homes heat themselves through. Uh, you know, burning of oil in the winter and it gets real cold up there. And so they had run this business. And the reason I like to tell this story is because it's the perfect example of kind of a competitive auction that uh, that you want to run. So the first valuation we did on the business was I think 12 million plus whatever was on their balance sheet. And um, 
and we got five or six uh, competing bidders to the table that were all strategic buyers and ended up selling for $20 million. Uh, and so the, the sellers were, were pleased. It was a, they're just a great family up there. Um, just a really, really down to earth, awesome people, you know, the, the, the dad and the, the, the dad who founded it was, was still alive. Um, I think he's passed away. This has been about a couple years ago now, but I think he's passed away. He was well into his nineties. The son who had been operating it for a number of years was retiring in his sixties, but they had held it for, they'd had it for years. What were some of the things you did, Nate, to prep? Because I know you are an expert at exit strategy, value maximization, growth strategy. So in that period of time, making sure it gets the maximum amount of value. What are some things that you did to prep them and the business before sale? Yeah, you know, it's the, obviously you want a really nice pitch deck so you can show people. But when it's a lot of deals are done by broad auction where you're, it's kind of spray and pray. You're going out to all the private equity groups, all the, all the, both the financial and strategic buyers. In this case, we knew the five or six people, uh, the five or six groups that were, were going to be the ones that would be willing to pay that premium. And then um, a, apart from, I mean, you, you prepare the financial statements as much as you can so that, that you, you're displaying the, EBITDA or, you know, some measure of cash flow in a way that, you know, puts the business in the best light possible. But at the end of the day, it's all, it's all about supply and demand. You know, if, if there's a high demand for the, the business as a going concern, then they, you know, and it's, it's a low yeah. supply. There's only one, you know, one su main supplier of, of the gas distribution fly going through Ketchikan Juno. And we, we also sold the, the sister business in Juno. So Ketchikan, Juno, um, they, they, now the company that acquired both of those firms owns the distribution pipeline all the way up to Anchorage. So you just so, know who, they, who they're so going to be. That's a key thing. point though, which is, you know, identifying the targeted key buyers. And I know some people, yeah, I remember um, I was in a, a room full of entrepreneurs and Vinny Fisher, shout out to Vinny Fisher. He's like, sometimes before he starts a business, he'll reach out to um, the potential buyers before he starts the business to see yeah. what the acquisition would look like and start that relationship from the beginning. I thought that was, I'm like, I didn't think of that. You know, Vinny's super smart on your end. But it, it ultimately you're saying the same thing. It's like you have to reach out to those targeted buyers. What does your reach out look like? Nate, like if you want to sell it, maybe they're not, maybe they're not in the buying stage. Maybe they are like, what do you send initially to, to get interest? Yeah. Well, usually it's done by blind teaser, right? So, but, but, uh, you know, much, much further prior to that, you have, um, you're always having conversations with potential buyers, especially if you're most investment bankers are really targeted at specific niches. Mm -hmm. So like in the digital media world, you know, there are, you know, dozens of private equity groups that would be interested in, in digital media type companies. You also have your strategic buyers. And so you're always kind of networking um, and, and prepping. And, and we have a pretty extensive CRM where we we keep detailed information on on buyers. And so we'll have like their deal parameters in there, we tag them with certain keywords, like maybe they want, you know, marketing technology companies and they want to see EBITDA greater than a million. And so anytime that something comes across, you already kind of have your short list and then you can go broad and create a much larger list. I'm going to close the door because it sounds like the wife and kids are coming back and it might get loud. We'll have them on, all four of them. Um, yeah. The, yeah. Uh, I mean, so that's a value, I mean, with, investmentbank.com and, and what you run there you one of the the values i imagine is you have these relationships with and kind of targeted pre-existing relationships who may be interested in these businesses yeah and that's that's a huge part of it you know uh the world is flat now when it comes to doing deals you know 30 years ago it was all about your own rolodex now you've got things like pitch book and capital iq and uh, I just spoke with Andy. Uh, he's a great guy. Andy, the owner of um, privateequityinfo.com. They're kind of the poor man's 
uh, pitch book. <laughs> Would and he like you saying that? <laughs> uh, I told him that yesterday. Okay. On the phone. I said, Andy, you're like the poor man's pitch book because they literally are, they're a fifth the cost. Of okay. Pitch book. So it's um, a positive thing, not a negative yeah, thing. Yeah, no, it's okay. great. They, you know, they've seen an uptick lately because people are canceling pitch book because it's too expensive and mm. they still need a solution, right? Okay. And so, so private uh, equity dot info you said what's uh, private equity info.com oh info.com got yeah. it private equity info.com okay we'll link that up and um so you go you you can pull data from there on on relative buyers you can search by industry by size um and so the the, the world is flat when it comes to the to the data so I think when it when deal makers have less of a, of an upper hand, I mean you can be a great negotiator, but it's really about I think w when it comes to doing deals, do you trust the people that you know that they're going to have integrity? Um, and second to that is, do you trust their their prowess to be able to close a deal? And also, I think it's one of those things where could you see yourself, you know, uh, having um you know, ha having hot dogs with their kids on their kid's birthday. It's like, do you like them? You know, yeah. get along with them. That's yeah. a big deal. What else that people may not think of that goes into a deal like that? Because you've done so many well, of these. I'm sure there's stuff you just do naturally. So, many, but... so there's so many, many nuances. You know, I, I, I'll, I'll, re I'll reverse engineer it. So when I, I sold my own home about three years ago when we moved, and I thought I can sell my own home. I'm not a real estate agent, never done it before, but I do these complex transactions and by golly, it was super easy because deals, there's always something. There's never, there's never, uh, it's never not clean because the complexity of, of the transaction, the complexity of each business, their operations are so different. There are so many different ways that you can trip, trip up and make mistakes that I would, I mean, and this is coming from, this is coming. This is not coming from a position of I, I make my money by selling business. This is just a, you know, if I were talking to a friend, never sell your business on your own. You at least need an attorney, minimally an attorney that knows what they're doing. You know, because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. there are so many areas that you can foul up. Talk so, about some of those. What are some big mistakes people make? Um, I I think I think a lot of times. Uh, and this is just from one that we're working on like within the last, this quarter, first quarter of this year, which all of, all of the six or seven deals that we're working on are on pause right now because of what's going on right now. But I think, I think a lot of times entrepreneurs, their greatest strength is also their greatest weakness when it comes to doing deals. And they're the, the greatest strength of entrepreneurs is that they're, they're hard drivers in that, they think of an idea, they, they want to get it done, they want to get it done immediately, and they will do anything to get it done quickly. But, you know, discretion is the better part of valor when it comes to getting deals done. And I think a lot of times you've got people who, um, you know, we measure our success in, in months and years, not days and weeks. And so when people want to have something done right now, a lot of times, you know, not firing off that email is the better response or just waiting because mm. a lot of times waiting waiting to see what will happen the other the other side will show their cards more rapidly mm. and not talking is sometimes preferable to talking and it's it, it's um there's a, a kind of a health, healthy balance there and any any really good entrepreneur that's done deals before in the art of negotiating i think the best thing that you can often do and this is where the investment banker is there. There are two, two, really two reasons an investment banker even adds value to a deal. The first is, is it provides a buffer. And a buffer is that you're not going to fire off that email or do something dumb. You're going <laughs> to, the investment banker is going to do it for you. He's going to take the arrows. She, he or she is going to take the arrows of, you know, be it, take the fault if someone gets, you know, peeved off on something. And the second reason would be that you have, um, you have someone there to provide options. You know, uh, you, you've got someone that's going to provide multiple options to get you the highest value because yeah. providing multiple options gets you the highest value. Yeah. Multiple buyers, multiple bidders, whatever you want to call it. You know? And the expertise, obviously. Yeah. And right. any pitfalls, right? Because one pitfall, like you said, is True. worth a lot of money and 
a mistake could be worth a lot of money and time in itself. Like people are trying to get it done fast. If they try to do it themselves, I can imagine it will probably take longer than they, you know, if they, if they try it. And what you're saying is it's almost like go against, at least for like an entrepreneur, go against your natural instincts. Like sometimes oh, natural instincts. Yeah, right? it goes against, because I'm an entrepreneur myself, right? It goes against my natural instincts, but it, uh, it, and because we're FINRA regulated, the, the saying always goes, if you can speak it, speak it. Uh, if you can speak it and not write it, speak it. And, and um, because, you know, what's written can't be, can't be taken back. And so it, the old adage, you know, measure twice, cut once. It just, you just, it's more slow and methodical rather than kind of yeah. like shoot from the hip yeah. type of stuff. I don't know what your next book is called, Nate, but sometimes I'm thinking book titles, something about, you know, don't follow your natural instincts or something like yeah. that. And the, the, yeah. uh, the guide to entrepreneurs selling their business. Don't follow yeah, your don't, natural. Don't instinct. go with your gut. Why your gut yeah. is wrong. I think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's your next like best selling book right there. Okay. Um, the I'll, proven, to, I'll, I'll get someone to ghost write it if, because I don't have the time, but the yeah. Proven yeah. field guide to selling your business. Um, yeah. so talk about Louisiana. There's an interesting scenario and, um, there's a, a business you sold in Louisiana. Yeah. So we actually helped acquire it. Um, oh, acquire it. I gotcha. Yeah. So uh, it wasn't us that acquired it. We were working with a search funder and I don't know if you're familiar with that model. No, go ahead. Um, what is it? So it's usually done by uh, graduates of top uh, business school programs. So your your Whartons, your your Harvard guys, Stanford guys, um, they'll go out and raise, uh, get committed capital. They may not, they're not raising a fund. They're getting committed capital to do a deal. And oftentimes that committed capital also pay them a salary in the interim to find a deal that they then become the operational CEO of, of the company and they'll get some sort of equity slice um, in the deal uh, and then a kicker at the end, depending on performance when it's, when it's sold in five or 10 years, that's the kind of the basis of it. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so this guy had reached out. He, he was, he had been at um, Bain and he had, done you know dozens of buy side transactions at bain he was a columbia mba great guy i mean his resume sold himself but he just didn't have the time to raise the money and the reason i like this deal is because i mean this was a spray and pray we went at we called like 600 groups because you're really you're sourcing debt and equity you got to have someone comfortable with the the guy that they're partnering with and boris brought some of his own money to the table i think he brought close to a million bucks. So he, he wasn't, he wasn't your standard kind of, um, uh, you know, search fund model cause he did have some capital, but, uh, we raised the additional equity and, and debt, uh, to do the deal. And he's still operating the company. This has been about a year and a half ago now, I think, but he's, it, I like, I, I liked that deal just because it was, um, it was not, it was atypical for what we do. Usually we're processing a sell side or we have a mandate. We're going out and sourcing. He came to us and said, I got this thing under LOI letter of intent. You know, I'm going to buy it. I just need the money. Mm -hmm. And so we just went out and cobbled up the money from institutional sources. So what was most successful? So like in that case, sourcing the money is kind of the key point there. What was, did you find, even though you did a spray and pray, I mean, you're doing it strategically also, what was most valuable in that as you went through that process to source the money? Yeah, I think it's, it, it kind of goes back to that, that data. You know, we'd done, we'd done a similar deal on a capital raise for uh, another business, but the, the data here was, you know, those that are comfortable with the search fund, funding search funders. And so, um, and, and then, and then, uh, processing that data quickly. So if they're, you know, if they're not interested, um, they're not interested, you know, the, the struggle is, is that you don't know if someone's there, there are, there are a few uh, data points in some of those in like pitch book and, and private equity info that, you know, they'll, they'll say that they work with search funders, but then there's a lot of stipulations. So it was kind of a discovery 
uh, for us, which was helpful because then the next deal hopefully will be easier if you have the right, if everything else is equal, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a little more discovery on, on that one. And that that's true for, you know, people, you know, when someone's trying to sell a business, the optimum uh, scenario is, is you have a, you have an investment banker that's done deals in the field. And part of that is, is it's just a, that you're not, you know, you're not waiting for them to find the buyer for you. They already know who the buyers are, which is, which is true in some respects. It can be faster, but it's not that much faster if you, if you've got a hustler. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the way the, the world works these days. But um, Nate, let's talk about audience bloom. Um, because that is your own journey of acquiring a business. So how did you, what, what was your decision making yeah. first deciding I want to even acquire something in that type of space? Well, I'm, I'm always looking for opportunities. So it, it came across, um, it's an area that I just understand. So it's not, um, it's not far afield. And, um, I, I love the model. It's a really high margin model. It's, um, it's super scalable uh, if you have the right team in place. And there aren't a ton of people who do it as well, who were, who'd still do it as well as Audience Bloom does it. They just do a great job. And, um, and I just, I found them through some of my networks. I mean, it was just by happenstance, it's a remotely run business. All of our employees are all over the country and, and even a couple overseas. And it happened to be a, a business that was run by a University of Washington grad that, I mean, mm -hmm. one of my employees is an, is 15, lives 15 minutes away. And he's, you know, so, and, and the, the former owner still lives here in Olympia, Washington. So it, it's, um, it was just kind of, it did you put it out to your network? Did you say, here's exactly what I'm looking for? Or was it more broad? Than no, that? I just found them. I found them on biz buy sell, mm. you know? Uh, I found them on there, you know, and, and negotiated through the whole thing. And it's nice when you know the, when you know, it, you know, the great thing is, is, you know, attorneys, I know all the SBA guys, uh, finance guys. And so, you know, you get a sweet deal from everybody. So when, when you, when you've been referring business to people for years, it, it's helpful because you, you're able to get the best deal on all the processing for the transaction. But Apart from that, you know, it's had its it's had its bumps after the acquisition. I think, you know, the former owner, great guy, but he's kind of been he'd kind of been a little bit absentee for about eighteen months because the business he had set up great systems and processes and stuff. And but then we I uh, came in and I'm like, well, we we want to grow it, so we, that's when we made the switch from Audience Bloom to SEO.co, and you know that that is uh, that's a risk that we took and it's it finally starting to pay off that was over a year ago that we made that move so what made you decide to take that risk change the name uh there was a little bit of negative press uh on the company unfair unfair negative press that had that's still out there um but there's also i um i i wanted something that when you come to when you came to the old website and you can look it up on wayback machine on archive.org but when you come to a website, it's always helpful to know exactly what they do right at the outset. And I wanted it to be very obvious. Yeah. You, know? you can't get more obvious than SEO.co. Yeah. What do these guys do? What do these guys do? Uh, SEO. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you might, you might say, yeah, it's, you know, it's, you probably could have, um, and the, the other flip side is, is when you have a domain like that, then, Eventually, it may take us three years, it may take us five years, but it'll be a lot easier for us in the long run to rank for terms that are really high volume, high um, convertibility terms that we never would have touched with the old domain name without a much larger budget on, you know, link building and yeah. our own content marketing. So that was that was another that, that was probably the main motivation, you know, something that is more of a global brand type of yeah site so i want to talk about nate you know the growth strategy you know anyone who buys a business obviously they want to grow it so it increases the value and what that looked like but but anything to talk about with the actual deal itself like putting it together it seemed like it was almost meant to be 
because you went to to Washington University, then they happen to be. I mean, is that just a weird coincidence? Yeah, the, just a weird coincidence. Okay, that is weird. Yeah, he had two. He had two other buyers um, that were interested, and those deals fell apart. One was in New Jersey, and one was in like Wisconsin or something. Yeah. So I mean, it just was. It just was happenstance that he's in my backyard. He's yeah, like, and he lives an hour from me. Was there Weird, anything in you know? the deal, like putting together a deal or, or finalizing the deal itself, that'd be important to mention before talking about the growth portion? Yeah, um, the negotiations went rather smooth. I think, you know, uh, it was my first. I've done, uh, you know, I've been entrepreneurial, but I've never acquired using debt. And so I was super anal. I mean, I took all of their their merchant transactions and I, I personally went through and did all the quality of earnings check against their tax returns. Mm. And that's not something that I typically will do. We'll usually have a CPA do it, but I'm like, I, I know what, I know what to do. And I went through and I looked at all the inflows and outflows for the last, you know, 18, 24 months and just confirmed that it, that the numbers were real. And I recreated the, the income statement off of that. And it, everything checked out. And, uh, apart from that, you know, gosh, the nuances of things. Did um, you decide to get outside sourcing of funds or did you, how did you end up? Yeah. I mean, it was a large that? enough, it's a large enough transaction that I did finance it. I used an SBA seven, a loan mm -hmm. and there is a personal guarantee on those loans, but, um, you know, uh, I think the I think the most important part is negotiating things like, like because for the SBA seven A loan, they do a debt service coverage analysis, and we do this all that. This is one of my favorite conversation topics. Actually, is people always tell me, "Oh, my business, I want to get this for my business, or I think my business is worth this." Well, I just take an SBA seven A loan uh, debt service coverage analysis calculator that we built internally, and I look at it and I say, "Okay, if." If your business is worth this, then it would it would require uh, a debt service coverage in your on your EBITDA or your cash flow to equal Y, and given that, I compare it to um, a cap rate on a real estate deal, and and if if it you know in so many cases people don't realize number one real estate's a lot harder to screw up, and a business is easy to screw up. If you do something wrong, you can foul up the whole thing. And so if you don't know what you're doing, and, and so I always say, it's, so number one, the risk profile of buying a business is much higher than buying real estate. And number two, for that risk profile, you should be uh, compensated in the return on your investment above and beyond what you would on a real estate deal. And so if you're, if you're a seller and you say, hey, my business is worth $10 million. Well, do the math on and comp it against, and this is, I just use this as a comp. I comp it against a, what, what would it equal? What would the cap rate equal if your business were a real estate transaction? So that's and the high side rate, is what you're talking about. What's that? Is that like the high end because you can't screw up the real estate? Yeah, it's easy. It's easy to, I mean, look, if you owned a piece of an asset like real estate, you could hire somebody uh, to manage, it's just easier to manage, you know, there's mm -hmm. not all the operational controls and everything. Every, it's just a lot more complex in a yep. business, you know? And so I always comp it against that. That's my benchmark is kind of commercial real estate, you know, cap rate. And if you're way off base on that, it's a no go decision. If you're a buyer, if you're a seller, it's like, well, you're priced out of the market. You really want to sell? Obviously, you don't really want to sell because you're not you're not priced within what the market will bear. And unless unless you're willing to find that needle in a haystack buyer who thinks you're that strategic, you know, home run. But you know, the WhatsApps and Instagrams of the world, those are that's funny money. That's not real. That's not real in the in the normal world of business. You know, most deals are done at three x EBITDA, three to four x EBITDA on on anything you know, less than 10 million in, in revenue. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's just kind of the nature of the, yeah. of the beast. Yeah. I appreciate you sharing that thought process. And then people can't go to investmentbank.com and find that calculator. That's something that you have, you'd use internally. 
Uh, I can I'd be happy to share yeah. it if you want. I think you should put it on your site. Have people like do calculations, drive some yeah, traffic, or... an interactive version of it. Yeah. Just say, hey, you know, you think your business is worth this? Go, go, just fill out the form here, and it'll yeah. tell you what it's worth. You know? Totally. Yeah, it needs yeah. to happen. It needs to happen. I just have a. a I built the Excel spreadsheet um, a number of years ago because I yeah. got tired of people saying my business is worth this, and I'm yep. like, oh, no, that's it's not. the new page. Tired of your of <laughs> your yeah. business is worth this? Actually, put yeah. it to the test. Here's my internal calculator. Yeah. If I know someone, you can hire them at dev.co probably to put it on your site. I, I know. know, I know plenty of guys. It's yeah, prioritization. Right? I know. You know, I'm just giving you a hard right. time. I'm allowed to do that. Um, so, uh, so you buy it. Then what's some of the steps you do to grow, grow the business after buying? Uh, I think well we're obviously doing our own content marketing. So this it's a, this is an interesting discussion just from like if you're running a, a website, right? So the website had I think 1,300 pages and posts on it, and we took so we took all, all of those pages. We re, I mean if you go to archive.org, you can see the old site. It's it was kind of an ugly baby, um, and we took all of the content and consolidated it down to less than 300 posts. I think when we were done, it was down around 280 posts and pages total. And we, we took some posts that were like 500 words and combined them with other posts that were a couple thousand. So we have a few blog posts on there that are 10, 10, 15, 20,000 words. And then we consolidated the link equity. So we redirected, we three or one redirected all the links from, you know, five different posts down to one post. So you, you get that extra boost. And we, um, we also changed the domain name at the same time, which I mean, super negative impact on, on traffic and rankings and everything. It was a huge risk, yeah. but I knew that as long as we could weather the storm with existing clients for say, you know, six to 12 months, then we'd be good. And so we, we redesigned everything. We we did all the 301 redirects uh, properly, and you know we're we're starting to see it come back out of the sandbox a little bit. It's taken a little while, but yeah. I mean we're we're ranking for things like link building service and stuff like that. So nice. we, we get leads off of it more readily now. Uh, Nate, talk about the services you provide there. What should uh, people go to there and check out? Mo most uh, most of what we do is is link building. And, and when I say link building, we have, you know, Jason, the former owner, really great network networker with when it comes to publications, like really high end publications where you might want to get a brand mention or, or uh, a link from. And um, in that we just have, and we're constantly, we have, we now have team members that do outreach for building the links and there we're constantly adding you know, new opportunities. So it's the, our primary focus is really content marketing. So um, I think 17 members of our team are all writers and they write for some really great publications out there online. And, um, and so that's the primary uh, uh, thing that we do. And the, probably about 40% of the revenue of the business comes from other agencies. So we, we are the back office support for a lot of other agencies who, don't want to and and just don't have the capacity to to you know do do link building at scale or do content marketing at scale so you know white labeling our services we have a lot of clients who well i mean it happens regularly where someone will come to us and we're like hey don't we already have this account but it's under an agency so we're already doing work for them uh through someone else so you're doing two things that work for them yeah yeah, yeah. well and usually, usually we'll we'll alert the client, so we we don't want to step on anyone's toes. We want to keep keep a high level of, of integrity and honesty with our clients. So we'll say, hey, so and so reached out to us, and then we just pass them back to to the client. So the but we have we have a you know about forty percent of our revenue comes from that, and um, uh, you know we do we do do some pay per click management, and we are. Now, you know, the growth opportunities now that we're looking at is we're bidding on some corporate and larger uh, requests for proposals. So those are much larger contracts putting together. And that's the benefit of being an investment banker, you know, putting together large proposal documents um, using PowerPoint stuff yeah. that's bread and butter. So we're doing a- we're, What we, kind of corporations 
are fit or what would be an example. I remember when we were scheduling this, like Jeremy, we have a bunch of big corporate proposals we're putting out. So can we push this to another week? Because it sounded like you had a bunch hit at once. What would be yeah, an example? Yeah, we had a few of... last week. Um, a couple large university contracts. Um, I signed some NDAs, so I, I can't yeah. close them. But uh, a couple large university contracts that have large budgets for everything from content marketing to link building and SEO and and they want some web development. And so yeah, kind of across the map. What's a, 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 like a popular service? I mean, I, you know, you offer a lot of things. Like let's say someone wants to grow their content marketing. What's a popular service? That yeah, yeah uh, links are kind of the name of the game. They still have such a high correlation in the search engines and it's hard mm -hmm. to get away from that. And so usually, you know, depending on the budget, you know, we work with small businesses as well as large. Yeah. Um, the small businesses have been hurt pretty, hit pretty hard um, of late, like the local SEO. We don't do too much local SEO. Our biggest thing is our biggest bread and butter clients. We have, we're really diversified. So we have clients in, in real estate uh, and e-commerce, SaaS, uh, lots of lawyers. Um and so uh, our, our bread and butter service is really, you know, someone's got a keyword that they want to rank for, you know, attorney in uh, Chicago or whatever it is. And, and we'll, the team will, will assess the site, do the site audit, and then kind of make recommendations based on what their findings are and then kind of go after it, you know, when it comes to building the link. So it's funny, Nate, you know, I've had people come on and talking to them after having them come on the podcast. I was like, oh, well, you know, one of the reasons, one of the reasons for coming on the podcast was SEO. They're like, I know I'm going to get a bunch of links. Oh, yeah, yeah, and, that's true. And we I, get people requesting that all the time. Yeah, get a bunch of links they back. Be, I, in fact, I ought to, I ought to refer people to you. I've got a couple in my email. Exactly. Account. I've got a couple that I'm looking at uh, uh, that came in within the last week. I, I, I really will. I'll send them your way. There's some interesting. I just. It's not. It's not the core focus of what I'm doing right now. I yeah. love to no, but it, it's. It will. It's like, okay, um, they will get a bunch of link if it's a fit for my show or for someone else's show, then they'll get a bunch of amazing links. You know, yeah. um, all over the place. So, yeah. um, it, it is. It is one of of a handful of strategies, and in fact, I think podcasting right now is um, underutilized when it comes to SEO. And totally. the reason the reason I say that is is syndication. There are, I mean, if you're using like we use Libsyn, and if you're using Libsyn, it'll syndicate to Podbean, iHeartRadio, and you're get and and uh, what's the other one? There there are like a half a dozen that you can get syndicated to. Totally. And you're getting you're getting uh, domain authority links in the 80s and 90s for free, uh, basically for free for doing a little bit of work, and you're getting. Yeah five or six per episode because you're syndicating. And so every episode you release, you get five. Do you know how much that would cost you're preaching you? the choir here? Totally. Yeah. Do you know what, what that would cost you for our services to do that? I mean, if you don't have a podcast, yeah. I, this is me preaching, but you're, I mean, I know this is what you do. So I'm, I'm just kind of doubling down on, on uh, your, your audience here. Cause it's a, it's, it's huge. You should be podcasting. Yeah. Totally. And that, you know, for when we tell people, they, that's like icing on the cake, because when you really figure out who your best relationships to, are and you want to give to them and have them on your platform, but there's all these added benefits. Like you said, SEO alone, I've had people search other guest names and I'm the top three search results because I'm yeah. on YouTube, my website, and one of those syndicated podcast channels. And yeah. so they're searching that person's name and I'm the top three search results. Which could be huge. Which could be huge, given what what you know, whatever name it might be, right? So yeah, it's totally. Um, first You're not going to get a lot of search volume for my name, though. <laughs> <laughs> so, don't bank. On, don't bank on that. We're going to keep increasing that for you. Yeah. All to benefit you. It's all about you know investmentbank.com uh, and seo.co. So in the end, it goes back to to where your your sources are. Um, so first of all, Nate, thank you. Um, I want to point people, I have one last question, but I want to point people to go to seo.co, investmentbank.com, check out everything Nate's doing. It's really amazing what he's done on his journey, starting and helping other people, you know, acquire companies, grow companies. 
Um, so Nate, the boy, the Boy Scouts of America. I see you do some yeah. work with. Yeah, I, uh, I, uh, the so I've I've I am an Eagle Scout, and so I, I love I love scouting, and I, I the. I mean, I think scouting uh, provides a lot of value, um, but I, I love camping and I love going out and just going. I mean, my favorite things that I did in scouting were 50 mile backpacking trips. I think I did, you know, three or four of those growing up and I, I just, it's, it's a lot of fun. So the scout committee chair is more of an administrative role though. And that's what I've been doing. For what did the you get time. the it growing, you know, being an Eagle Scout, what is a story that, you think back on that kind of represents your journey is that uh i think my i just i love um uh, the the my first 50 miler i did when i was 13 and for a kid that's carrying like a 60 pound pack that probably doesn't weigh, <laughs> doesn't weigh uh, I, I mean i probably weighed 100 pounds you know and uh it, it's uh it's a good it's just a good character building exercise when you're hiking 10 to 15 miles a day, a day with, you know, a 60 pound pack on your back that weighs more than half of your weight and you're preparing your own food and, um, and you're, you're not connected to, I mean, back then we didn't have, there weren't cell phones anyway, but you're, you're just completely back to nature. There's nothing else to focus on. And I mean, we, I grew up around here in Seattle and I'm not biased in the fact that I believe that we live in probably one of the prettier areas in the, in the country, if not the world. And so we, I mean, hiking around Mount Rainier, uh, in the summertime when it's, when the weather's nice and you're, you're drinking, you're filtering water out of these crystal clear streams and swimming in, in mountain lakes. It's awesome. You just mm. can't, beat it, you know, picture that. Thank you. First of all, Nate, Thank you, Ryan, for making sure this happened. And uh, everyone check out investmentbank.com, SEO.co. Thanks, Jeremy. Appreciate it. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.